This is Floss Weekly. I'm Doc Searles. This week, Aaron Newcomb and I are talking with John Wunderlich about standards and open source. That's coming up next. Floss Weekly is brought to you from LastPass Studios. Securing every access point in your company doesn't have to be a challenge. LastPass unifies access and authentication to make securing your employees simple and secure, even when they are working remotely. Check out lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This This is is Twit. Twit. This is Floss Weekly, episode 608, recorded December 9th, 2020. What makes a standard? This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Worldwide Technology. WWT's Advanced Technology Center is like no other testing and research lab with more than a half billion dollars of equipment, including solutions from key partners like HPE and Intel. And it's virtual, so you can access it 24-7. To learn more about WWT, the ATC, and become a member of their growing community, go to wwt.com slash twit. And by LastPass, don't wait until the end of the year to get strong security. Start solidifying your cybersecurity strategy with the award-winning LastPass today. Go to lastpass.com slash twit to find out how they can help you. Hey there, everybody, everywhere you are. Uh, Good morning where I am. I am Doc Searles. And this is Floss Weekly. I am joined this week for a co-host by Aaron Newcomb, who should come in any second. There he Here is. Hey, Aaron. How you doing? Is hey. that that is your real background, isn't it? That's that's, yeah, that's actually... my real background. You know, you can't <laughs> see the good stuff on this side. All you get to see is the mess on the backside. Uh, but that's okay. Where, that where mess on earth means is there's it? lots Out... of projects going on. Yeah. Uh, outside your abode, where are you in on on the sphere? Yeah, I'm in the Bay Area, so. Uh, enjoying the the weather we were just talking in chat actually you should join chat by the way if you if you listen and you can listen live you should get on the chat because there's a lot of good discussion there but we we're just talking about you know some people have snow some people don't is it going to be a white christmas am i going to have to shovel uh but luckily being in the yeah. bay area you don't have to worry about that it's uh, no shoveling in the bay area and unfortunately nice. i'm in i'm in santa barbara which is is milder than everywhere at any given time every time i'd fly here to be like wait a minute this is this can't be real. And it's like that. It's like, I don't know, 70 degrees here or like, I guess, 20 in uh, in in Canadian <laughs> and European, <laughs> which is where uh, our, our, our guest is, which uh, do you know, John, at all? You know, we talked a little bit ahead of the no. show. I, I, I don't, but I'm uh, looking forward to the discussion because uh, I, I, I think that it, the dynamic between standards and open source is really interesting. I think they go hand in hand in a lot in a lot of cases, yeah. but they yeah. are slightly different. So it would be good to hear what the, you know, the differences between standards and open source are. They the same thing? Are they not? Um, you know, how do how what's the interplay between the two? Yeah, I think I think if you could have battle ribbons for standards, um, you know, there that John would have a whole a chest full of them. Um, so this is John Wunderlich, our guest, coming up shortly. And we'll get to that. But first, I have to let you know that this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Worldwide Technology, known simply as WWT. WWT began building their advanced technology center, the ATC, 10 years ago, and it has grown exponentially. It's like no other testing and research lab. The lab contains more than a half billion dollars in equipment from hundreds of OEMs and key partners ranging from high-tech heavyweights like HPE and Intel to disruptors like Equinix. WWT is a trusted partner who stays with you over the years. Many of their customers have been with them for over a decade because they know WWT is where they can go to get the answers they need to make sure their business runs right. Their ATC is an incubator for IT innovation and offers So they have schedulable and on-demand labs like HPE's Primera Storage Lab, along with hundreds of other labs representing the newest advances in cloud-based machine learning and storage. 
learn about products before you launch. WWT's engineers use these environments to quickly spin up proofs of concept and pilots using the sandbox so customers can confidently select the best solutions. In many cases, this reduces the concept time from months to weeks, which increases speed to market. They offer lab as a service, a dedicated lab space within the ATC. Here, customers can perform programmatic testing using the vast technology ecosystem that WWT has already built. It's also virtual, so you can take full advantage of ATC's unique benefits anywhere in the world 24-7. WWT engineers work in these labs every day, beta testing new solutions based on the latest and greatest HPE technologies and building reference architectures and custom integrations to help their customers make decisions and see results faster and with much less investment. WWT has launched their new digital platform encompassing the ATC ecosystem. This ecosystem creates a multiplier effect of knowledge, speed, and agility anytime, anywhere around the world for their customers. Get access to articles, case studies, hands-on labs, and other tools that make the difference in today's fast-paced world. To learn more and to discover why organizations across industries Turn to WWT to guide them on their digital transformation journey. Visit WWT.com slash twit. And don't forget to create a My WWT account to access resources available through WWT's Advanced Technology Center ecosystem. That's WWT.com slash twit. WWT, delivering business and technology outcomes from around the world. Okay, so greetings, everybody. Welcome to Floss Weekly again. Um, our guest this week is uh, John Wunderlich, who is actually an old friend and um, uh, has been a, uh, a compadre on a number of, of cooperative efforts and fights that, we're, that we are all having in the open source and the standards-based world. So greetings, John. I know where you are, but maybe you can tell the rest of us where, where you are as well. I'm in my living room. <laughs> <laughs> which is uh, lo which is located in uh, Toronto looking at the the overnight snow starting to melt as the temperature uh, goes above zero <laughs> that's 32 for our american <laughs> listeners so 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 john i have, i have a um a couple of quick quick questions to get us started sure. um the the first has to do with canada which is that there seems to me to be in the identity world, which I think is where I first met you, but it may have been somewhere else. Um, uh, and in the standards development world, an unusually high percentage of Canadians, and I think it must be a real percentage because for the most part, Canadians don't tend to yell about their participation. They just come in and do the heavy lifting. So do you have a theory on this or is it just wrong? I haven't heard it posed quite that way. Uh, and as a Canadian, I tend to spot Canadians wherever they are, whether it's uh, uh, William Shatner on uh, on Star Trek or uh, or uh, Rachel McAdams and and so the actors and so forth and so on. And because I'm in the space here in Canada, I, I get to see that. So I, I I don't know if it's true internationally. I do know that there's a lot of us that are active in a number of standards bodies. Uh, but when I get to the international standards bodies like the ISO, and we punch a little bit above our weight, but maybe not extraordinarily above our weight. You know, I uh, was watching the uh, the series The Undoing, and you have the kid who's a Brit and uh, Nicole Kidman who's from Australia, and they're doing perfect American accents. But Donald Sutherland was playing playing Nicole Kidman's dad. And he let drop and a boot and an oot as well. So he was spotable as a, as a Canadian. He's a great actor. But a couple of those things got through. So uh, so t tell us just some of the efforts you're involved with, even though I know some of them. You may be involved with um, more than, than I know. In fact, I suspect you are. The Well, you, you and I are both on a uh, one of your personal favorites, uh, the uh, and the IEEE Standards Association around uh, user-submitted terms, which is an 
which is a committee in the IEEE study. But the, my main work in IEEE is uh, on the data privacy process, which is working on a standard on how you can integrate privacy into a systems engineering perspective. So most standards in the privacy space help privacy professionals standardize the tools and ways that they do privacy. The IEEE effort is to provide tools for engineers and systems people so that they can understand privacy in the context of their own lives. And the, my newest effort uh, is I'm uh, leading a discussion group in the Cantera initiative, uh, which is where um, the consent receipt came out of, uh, where user managed access uh, comes out of, where the blinding identity taxonomy has come out of, where uh, on the other side, Cantera does a lot of work on uh, conformance testing for identity uh, proofing is uh, to do uh, privacy and identity considerations for mobile driving licenses, which is a, a new standard out of the ISO so that you can present uh, your driving license uh, on your phone in a way that protects your privacy and identity. Um, some other initiatives, but that, that gives you a, a flavor. Yeah, I, I, I want to loop back just for a second only because I'm very self-interested in it to the uh... – uh, to P7012, which you're involved with. Uh, we had our meeting, uh, uh, monthly meeting yesterday. It's a formal name is Standard for Machine Readable Personal Privacy Terms. And an important thing about that, and I, this can help uh, help us get to where I think Aaron wants to jump in. Um, the IEEE actually approached some of us um, pretty much in the position that, like, we've always dealt with big companies and we want to start dealing with individuals. And there's a group of you that seems to be moving forward with privacy, uh, or is it, do you say privacy in Canada? I'm not sure, but anyway. Um, uh, I say privacy, uh, Brits say privacy. Yeah, Brits say privacy. So, um, but, but with, um, but, but approaching it from the individual side, you know, rather than always from the corporate side. And that's a really important thing right now because we've tended to think since the web came along and really the GDPR has sort of almost amplified this, the privacy is a grace of big companies and we have to opt in or out of their terms and the rest of it. And what we're trying to do with this particular project is come up with our terms. What are our terms as we go into these things? And it's still fairly early in our development, but I, would th I think we're making good progress. But that was an interesting thing that a big organization that's as efficient as, um, as the IEEE was seeing a need here, and I think probably open source has something to do with that too. To a certain extent. I mean, this is one of the things I, when I was thinking about this uh, call, um, I used to work for a regulator and in government and regulatory space, there's something called regulatory capture, where, uh, for example, uh, in an industry, the Industry Lobby Association that works for the industry that profits in that industry has a lot of money and lobbies the regulator and the regulator ends up aligning its thinking just because it spends so much time with the industry and, and in essence becomes captured by the industry. And I think both in standards and in open source, this is where the, the similar thing, there's a risk of corporate capture where because the corporate entities are able to support engineers uh, to work on open source projects or to work on uh, standards, a lot of the input into the standards bodies or to the open source projects is indirectly financed by the uh, by the by the corporate entities behind those individuals. And as um, Upton Sinclair I think, said, um, don't ever ask a man to question something where questioning it would uh, challenge his paycheck or words to that effect. So I really applaud the uh, IEEE for taking that effort to reach beyond the, uh, the sponsors to individuals and uh, civil society. And also there's a whole series of standards, the P7000 series, which starts with ethical, P7000 itself, which is ethical considerations in systems design, are all going to be uh, free standards, uh, as opposed to a lot of the IEEE standards, uh, which uh, one has to pay for which makes sense given you know, engineering standards for waveforms in 
5G networks or things like that. I, I want to ask a little bit more about open source and, and other similarities that there may be between open source and standards. But before I do that, I'm just kind of curious, how did you get started in this, John? How did you get started down this road of, of standards and, and dealing with committees and I don't know. There must be. There must be. Did you fall into a trap somewhere? Did someone? There's. <laughs> so you there, there's. Go work on these things. I have. Uh, I had. Uh, it's, a, it's a circuitous journey, but I, I had 20 years in IT and operations, on the corporate side, and uh, the company I, I used to work for came to me a little less than 20 years ago and said, "There's these new emerging privacy rules. Do you want to take on a project about privacy for the company?" Oh, that was kind of interesting, and when I there's a whole backstory to it, but so I took it on as a project. Uh, I was doing Six Sigma and operations and stuff like this, so I, I started doing privacy in the context of operations for that company. I got offered a job by a regulator, so I moved over to the regulator, then I moved over to, and it just sort of, you know, you put one foot on a path. And all of a sudden, you end up going down that path. You look back and go, well, that's not where I thought that would go. That's what happened. <laughs> so you did sort of that's, fall into it a little bit, at least. Uh, kind of, um, yeah. Yeah, you didn't know it was going to be quite take over quite this this much of your life, probably. Um, yeah. but, I, but going back to the open source question, what other similarities? That was an interesting one that you brought up. I hadn't thought about that before that, you know, it's the going, you know, I know we don't talk about politics on the show, but it's the lobbyists, right? It's kind of like yeah. who's who's behind that standard, who's behind that open source project. It's something we talk about a lot on this show in terms of, uh, you know, that's why one of the questions we often ask when we talk about our open source project is who are the contributors? How many other contributors do you have? Or is it just one company that's contributing the, you know, the bulk of the code. So in this case for standards, are there examples that you could think of? I hate to put you on the spot like this, but um, where a company or an industry has come in and taken over the standard to suit their own interests? Not the ones that I've been involved with, although there's a risk of that in any open source or standards effort. If, if you can link that endeavor, whether it's an open source project or a standard, to the ability of one entity to make additional profit, they're going to be motivated to try and influence it that way. I mean, corporations are profit maximizing and endeavors, so one shouldn't one shouldn't blame them for that effort. You just need to put in governance procedures to to try and counteract that. Um, this is not a space that I'm in, but. Uh, if I was, for example, a well-financed electric vehicle manufacturer of some kind who had a particular kind of plug-in and device to charge my vehicle, I would be well-motivated to make sure that whatever standards bodies were involved standardized on what I was already manufacturing, especially if, it, if there was some copyright or patent on some of those uh, on some of those devices. So you can insert your name there, but that would be the same in any space. Back in the 1920s or earlier, there was a move, if you bought a car from a manufacturer, you would have to buy gas from that manufacturer's gas station. So this is a long, long standing, uh, long standing problem. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking too of things like, uh, 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 safety standards and, uh, you know, things like, uh, you know, since I deal with electrical uh, projects a lot and I'm working on mains power, if I didn't have those standards, uh, you know, how would you even design a circuit if you didn't know what frequency you expected to see off your AC line? I'm kind of curious to know what other examples from your past that you've seen that have been very impactful, that have had a huge impact on the industry or on people, individuals. Well, look at the difference between SMTP and uh, the social graph. So uh, SMTP is a protocol, which is a standard in essence, right? There's, a, there's an RFC for SMTP. Uh, I'm old enough that I remember that the only email that you could do is when you had to go into the room at the university, you know, log into your the mainframe and, and, and do it that way. 
Uh, but SMTP essentially means you can use whatever email host and email client you want, and they'll be able to talk to each other because there's a standardized uh, protocol for that. Whereas uh, flash forward 20 or 25 years and social networks, no such thing. So platforms have replaced protocols and you end up mm -hmm. with network effect dominance where if you want to engage with somebody on a social network, you essentially have to join their same platform. Imagine if I wanted to email you and you said, well, you're going to have to join the Acme email company and use their email system to send me an email and doc was on uh, some other email provider and i had to you join that system to email doc that just that's bizarre if you think about it in terms of email but that's the world we live in for uh, our social networking yeah it's interesting i asked this question as well on the on the irc um uh, you know which which standard do you think has has been you know most important? And a lot of them are saying things like, uh, just Nick says basically anything web related, um, HTTPS, you know, WC three standards, etc. Um, mm -hmm. And and I would agree too. I think we 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 the three of us have been around long enough that we remember the early days of the internet and what web pages look like. <laughs> I, I think days, I still right? remember my, I still, I think I still remember my CompuServe number, 70146 comma. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I forget the second. I remember mine, uh, <laughs> 70246 dot, comma one six two. Yeah. Yeah. Way back. So when. yeah, no, it's, uh, what, what's sad think, though is, uh, yeah. is when I, when, when, um, people who are, deeply versed in a domain and and are really smart keep making stupid mistakes because they think they're smart in their domain and my first degrees were in history and you see that with history geeks and politics geeks and you see it with engineering geeks right there's an xkcd cartoon that uh i forget 795 maybe somebody comes up and says there's 14 competing standards I'm going to invent a new standard to unify those standards. Last panel, there are 15 competing standards. Um, <laughs> right. So the thing to understand about standards that actually work, that get adopted in the real world, is that they're necessarily the lowest common denominator. So if you, if you think, for example, there's a whole series of standards in the ISO, the 27,000 series that have to do with information security management systems, ISMS, so information security. And when I work in that space and I go to some enterprises, they say, oh, that's too hard. There's so many details. And, what, and I just sort of roll my eyes. I, mean, I get that paying somebody to certify you to, to show that you're compliant with that standard, that's expensive. But uh, if you think about the ISO standard, and most standards bodies are like this, you get 100 countries in a room trying to agree on something. The only thing that they'll ever agree on is the absolute lowest possible common denominator. So if you've got a well-established international standard, that's not a high bar, that's a low bar. And it's, it's interesting that a lot, of, a lot of technical people who are very smart don't understand that process and say, well, how many times did we go through smart people reinventing encryption for their particular uh, device and keep being surprised when somebody broke it because they wouldn't use standardized encryption libraries? I don't know if that was responsive, but that's where my mind went with that question. <laughs> no, it was. Go ahead, Doc. Yeah, I, I, I just want to um, go back to the situation you were talking about, John, with... Um, with email versus chat, email, SMTP, uh, POP3, and IMAP uh, worked out. And we still have it. And you don't have to go to the Gmail platform in order to do mail. Uh, Gmail is just yet another platform. It's substitutable. Um, you can run your own email server if you want. And that one worked out. Um, what happened with chat was XMPP didn't, you know, worked for a while, um, but it didn't end up being the thing that unified all of chat and instead we chat is now sms a few xmpp compliant things and then every platform there is i remember looking a couple of years ago at 
at um, both the Am- uh, the uh, uh, Android um, uh, store Jabber. and the Apple st- and the Apple store for the apps. And there was like Apple had like 175 chats, and uh, and Google for Android had about the same. Yeah, they see oh, yeah. who you put up there. The, <laughs> there it is. I know. I looked it up immediately. It just you'd look up XMPP and standards, and there it is. And but XMPP was a standard. It actually worked for a bit, you know, yeah. and Google adhered to it for a while. And I think even um, uh, even Facebook used XMPP, but which is originally called Jabber. Um, and uh, but it didn't take. I mean, something happened, and and I think it was because everybody wanted to do something nobody else could do. And then it kind of went sideways, and we have this sort of um, a situation that's kind of a, a sorcerer's apprentice thing, except they're not all identical mops as there were with the sorcerer's apprentice. They're all different mops, and you need a different mops for every every possible different thing. And then you have to go through this negotiation. We have this now with uh, conferencing. Are we using Zoom or Teams or Skype or you know WebEx or one of the other ones, and it's not a hard thing to do. But there is no standard in the midst of all of those. They're all all a bunch of platforms. And and maybe I'm hoping you have an insight on this. How do we, or how by we I mean, how do the bigs especially become mindful of the graces that gave us the internet and email, for example? I mean, we don't. We, it it's kind of like they forgot. You know, it's like we want to do our own Internet over and over and over again, even though the, we have this rising tide that has lifted all boats. But the idea of making a rising tide um, and open source similarly, mm-hmm. Linux won mostly because it was just too damn useful. Um, and it wasn't a standard. It was an open source thing. But but there's even, you know, there was pro- proliferation within that of of distribution as, as well, because you want a, a different pile of stuff wrapped around the kernel. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about that. Well, I'm Somebody on the board of it. I'm on the board of something called uh, My Data Global, an NGO uh, for that ha- based on the notion that people should be at the center of their own data. And in in My Data, we talk about the BLTS sandwich, the which doesn't stand for uh, bacon, le- lettuce, and tomato, but stands for business, legal, technical, and social. Uh, Due deference for Daza Greenwood over at the Civics Project at MID, who came up with the BLT, we added the social. And Lawrence Lessig has something similar about the four, or what does it call them, law, technology. But you need all of those things to be aligned at the end of the day for transformative change. And part of what's going on in a technology-driven space is that there's insufficient recognition that um, there is regu- there is room for regulation and there needs to be room for citizen engagement and those things need to be incorporated. Um, so to your point about rising all boats, right? The, um, a lot of technology companies are built on technologies that were publicly funded uh, and then, then they turn around to make pri- uh, private profit uh, without and the good ones will recognize community engagement, uh, others not so much. So, so it's figuring out the balance in any particular use case or scenario. Uh, to the point that Aaron made earlier about um, circuitry. If you think about it, there's standards. If you just think about building a house and doing the electrical for a house, there are international standards for copper wiring. And if you add standards uh, about um, voltage, like national standards or codes about voltages. So if you're going to run a 220 volt line into your house, you need to use a, and I'm just making this up, it's not my area, 10 gauge solid copper uh, end to end. Uh, So the standard is the 10 gauge, but then you've got the code, which is a regulation that says you must use that standard. So they all build on each other. And the code, the codes uh, come out of uh, consumer safety and, and regulation. So you need all four elements, business, legal, technical, and social to make that work. I have a, just some quick thoughts about that. But first, I want to say this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by LastPass. Companies face cybersecurity threats 
no matter where your employees are working, whether they're connecting from an office or from home, the risks of cyber attacks such as data loss and data breaches are something companies need to plan for and work to mitigate. A solid cybersecurity strategy is arguably more important while employees are working from home, given that more factors from the Wi-Fi network to shared devices may be outside the direct control of IT. That's why LastPass is so crucial to protecting your business. IT and security leaders can take back password security. They can have control they need from a central dashboard. Businesses can customize admin privileges, ensuring that any given admin has only the right level of access. No matter your organization's source of truth, LastPass integrates to onboard users, sync groups, and revoke access. Access to security scores and dark web monitoring to see real-time readouts of your business's password hygiene and provide alerts to employees when credentials may be at risk. For every employee, you can view their password scores, gain access to shared accounts, monitor group memberships, and more. LastPass's zero-knowledge security model protects everyone from the individual user to the biggest organization. They allow employees to go password-less while giving them access to the tools they need to work. LastPass ensures complete security in the cloud with strong encryption algorithms, local-only encryption, multi-factor authentication. IT leaders need to invest now in upgrading or adding security technologies that make remote work safer and more productive, and LastPass is the best place to start. Don't wait until the end of the year to get strong security. Start solidifying your cybersecurity strategy with the award-winning LastPass today. Go to lastpass.com slash twit to find out how they can help you. That's lastpass.com slash twit. So, so John, you, you mentioned Lessig earlier, as Lawrence Lessig, he wrote a a book called Code is Law, and then, uh, and, or Code rather, and other, Code and Other Laws of Cyberspace. Um, and, uh, and and he created this, this concept that Code is Law, and his four modalities were norms, law, market, and architecture. Um, and sometimes he called architecture the tech itself. Um, and so I, I want to go to a, something in your past that we haven't mentioned yet, which is that you were an air traffic controller. At one point, I, was, I trained as an air traffic controller. I didn't quite oh, get trained the final. as one. Uh, I, I was controlling oh, okay. aircraft. I, I was controlling aircraft, but uh, I, I didn't take my final check ride and uh, get my license. But yeah, I have worked as an air traffic controller. I yeah. don't want to overplay. So it, it, well, that's good. Um, well, you're you're being uh, um, um, honest and kind, and I think that's helpful. Uh, that's important. Um, you're, uh, but, but but I'm but I'm thinking that there's something about that that's similar to programming in the sense that you need to keep lots of lots of moving things and dependencies in mind, but you're operating within a structure, right? And, yeah. and air traffic is a very, is incredibly highly standardized. I mean, to the point oh, yeah. where, you know, I mean, I mean, GPS is involved now, but still there are these ground beacons that everybody's playing off of. And there are these established routes and cross points in the middle of the sky and so forth. Yeah. And it's an example of, worldwide of a single standard in use that's very People, useful. I'm wondering if there, what lessons there are there going back over to free and open source software. I think the it's interoperability, if you think of it that way. There's uh, To claim to be an international airport, you have to have controllers in the tower and at the terminal that speak English. But they don't really speak English. They speak air traffic control. You You can be Chinese and understand how to say... Air Canada 123 Shenzhen Tower, turn left, maintain heading 123, right? You don't need to actually speak English. There's a very limited vocabulary with very specific meanings within that. So uh, that, that's a standardized vocabulary that gives uh, very clear directions that anybody who takes the time to learn the vocabulary can then use to construct a complex route from A to B. And if you think about JavaScript, which there was completing flavors of JavaScript early, and then it's now standardized as ECMAScript. I think it's, what is it, version 8? Somebody, can, I'm sure somebody will correct me in the chat. Um, so that you can, you can write, 
you can write code that uh, that uh, gets you from A to B on the internet. And if everybody had to implement their own version of JavaScript, well, we saw what happened with Java and the various containers and how that worked out. I'm curious, just listening to this discussion, uh, going back to something we kind of started by talking about, which is, uh, I don't want to say they're all bad actors, but you know, companies that get involved with standards. But there's also the government side of things as well, right? Um, because... You know, I, I, I'm assuming that that's not all a bad thing. Some people are uh, averse to government stepping in and and regulating and doing things. But at some level, we talked a little bit about GDRP, for example. At some level, government isn't it the role of government to step in and create standards where there are none to make sure that uh, things are working the way that the way that they are and their citizens are protected. Yeah, well, I think it's probably more correct to say it's appropriate to set a floor. Mm. Uh, uh, to allow innovation and, and competition, at least in the space we're talking about here and other areas like criminal activity, it's, it, it w would be different. Um, but establishing the rules of the game. Um, if you watch five, six, seven, eight-year-olds get together to play a game, whether it's marbles or when I was growing up, we used to take toothpicks and put them in the gutter and race them uh, in, after rainfall down the uh as a, see the, but the first thing kids get together is they set the rules for the game that they're playing, right? So whether it's the stock market, technology, um, electrical appliances, there has to be a set of rules to enable people to work together. Um, we work out those world, work rules socially and we call them sort of and we come to live by them, and that what defines the culture or the society that we live in. But even then, there are rules. In the United States or Canada, for that matter, you, one doesn't tend to talk about one's income. In Finland, uh, everybody's tax filings are public, right? So nobody's income is a secret. There's a huge cultural difference, right? Which you, so you think privacy is universal, but if I can go to my to my next door, go to the uh, tax office and see what my neighbor's tax filings are. Maybe not the detail, but the high level. That that changes a lot of things. So yeah, it sets mm. a floor. And I didn't by even setting a floor, that that that's what this. Yeah, you set a floor to discourage bad actors. All right. Huh. So if if you determine that um, selling uh, selling access to my health data to pharmaceutical companies so that for nefarious purposes is a bad thing, you say, well, don't do that. And then pharmaceutical companies sort of that raises the floor and everybody can compete because if you don't have a floor, then the good actors, depending on the circumstances, will be at a disadvantage to the bad actors. Yeah, and I'm trying to think too, it seems like there's a, there's a we've all seen potential for uh, competing standards and the difficulty that that creates, right? So you were talking about uh, different privacy standards, for example, and I know that our customers are dealing, well, even, even the company I work for, Sysdig, you know, we have to deal with, since we have people uh, using our platform all over the world, you know, we have to deal with multiple privacy standards from everywhere. And it seems like in a lot of cases, there should be a way to consolidate those standards so that you don't have to comply with multiple standards at the same time, uh, because it creates a lot of extra work for companies. I'm just curious from your point of view, um, are, are there any cases where that's happened, where those there was competing standards and they kind of coalesced into, and I'm thinking maybe maybe around web is the best example, I don't know, but there's competing standards and, and people agreed and they said, okay, let's, that, that common denominator um, setting the floor, we're going we're gonna to all agree to set it at this level so that we can interoperate better. Well, probably all agree is too strong, but the ones that came to mind, I already talked about JavaScript coalescing into ECMAScript and mm -hmm. then HTML5. There was all kinds of custom HTML extensions. It just was uh, the start of, the, especially browsers, uh, browser specific. And once those, once they start to diverge, you you start to lose a lot of advantages. So, I think um, those are two examples that come to mind. But there there has to be a reason. Um, 
if it's safety or growing a market pie, sometimes that'll happen. But sometimes standards are just standards because that's the way they are. They don't necessarily have a rational basis. So when I was working in China some years ago, I was going back and forth between Shenzhen, which is uh, the People's Republic, and Hong Kong, which are actually one urban area. But Hong Kong, the former British colony, you uh, the the you you drive on the uh, on the uh, right the, the right side of the car, and in Shenzhen, in the People's Republic, the cars are like they are in North America. And so you had these cars going back and forth, driving on both sides. And uh, it's the only place I've ever seen where there was sort of large amounts of both left and right hand drive vehicles on the road. Doesn't really matter one or the other. It's just confusing when you've got both on the road. Yeah, that's a great example. Are there any best practices for creating a standard? Is there an approach that works to gain consensus? Is, is there things you can do, you know, good things you can do, the right way to do it and the wrong way to do it? Uh, patience is a virtue. Uh, God or evolution or whatever your uh, originating factor is gave us uh, two eyes, two ears, and only one mouth in that proportion for a reason. Spend more time watching and listening than you do speaking uh, to uh, to achieve consensus. Um, standards are Pareto optimized. They're where the perfect is inherently the enemy of the good. Your particular idea may well be brilliant, but only for your use case or your scenario. And if you need everybody to follow it, you may have to hold your nose and accept a diminution or an exclusion of your particular thing to get the general accepted. So there's a... Um, a lot of time needed and a lot of discussion and a lot of let's agree to disagree, but get it done this way, which really goes against the grain for a certain mentality of developer or technologist who knows the right way to do things because they're smart, which makes for interesting conversations in technical subgroups. So, um, John, because you're involved in so many of these, um, I'm interested in the different manners involved. I mean, so the IETF, for example, was, you know, it was famously about loose consensus and running code and um, and operated off RFCs, which uh, requests for comment, uh, which are basically a letter to that somebody sends in uh, and mm -hmm. and everybody kind of agrees on it. That's where the protocols for email, for example, came along. Um, uh, the W3C really grew out of the fact that the web had appeared. I mean, it kind of grew around Tim Berners-Lee's original work, and it was a kind of an attempt to formalize that, where um, the, the, uh, the IEEE um, is highly formalized. I mean, we have Robert's Rules of Order. We have people from the IEEE itself that are in charge of that particular society sitting in on the meetings. We have, you have to have a quorum. There's all that kind of stuff. Um, and it's very formalized. And so I'm wondering if you just have any thoughts about that or remarks on that or, or what you even think is the ideal way to do these kinds of things. If, if you screw up, do people die? Or if you screw up, are people harmed? <laughs> Not right? yet. So <laughs> I'm dealing I'm with fearing electric, this. Yeah. When, when you're dealing with electrical standards and power standards, if you screw up, people die. Oh, right? so this is the, I, the IEEE, for right? example. So, right, yeah. You yeah. want to make sure that uh, when I'm running current into a house I'm, or when I reach over to turn on my lamp here and I just touch the lamp, I'm not going to get electrocuted. Right? But a lot of, especially in the early days of the web, nobody died. But now we see what's happening with uh, social networks. There's a lot of harm happening, right? So there's, there's more and more formalism coming to web standards because the consequences are becoming more and more grave. And as consequences become grave, the stakes go up. You want to make sure you get it right. And, you know, having people snapping their fingers or applauding and, and saying, OK, I think that's OK, isn't necessarily good enough if that's going to lead to the genocide of a population. So, Sorry to be OK, ahead. go ahead. Do you want to take it, uh, Aaron? Uh, I was I was just going to follow up on that. I mean, I think that's all it's just. I guess as we're talking, it's just like 
I'm realizing how much of our lives are affected by standards in one way or another. Um, I, I mean, there's almost nothing that you can do uh, that doesn't have some sort of standard applied to it. Like, um, like look, looking at the shelves behind you, those are standard width boards, standard thickness, connected with standardized screws using standardized thread patterns with standardized tools and patterns on the... Uh, otherwise, you'd have had to go out and dig your own iron, cut your own wood, and then start to put it all together on a custom basis, and you wouldn't have shelves. You'd be a caveman. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's kind of kind of crazy now that I think about it. I am curious uh, if there's any effort afoot. So, um, in in the industry that I work in, there's a lot of uh, a lot of companies are adopting you know infrastructure as code, and we've heard about you know network as code and all kinds of things. And and there's a lot of effort going into hey, I don't want to keep my uh, configuration files, for example, in a document that's only accessible to certain people. I want to put it in GitHub and then use that GitHub process to iterate over these things and accept changes. And then whenever I need that code, I just pull it from GitHub and I know I've got the latest and greatest thing. Similar to software code development. Um, uh, but I'm kind of curious if that same thing would apply to standards. Could standards be um, managed that way? Is the well, process similar? Stand standards are kind of managed that way. If you look at ISO standards, like you'll see ISO the X colon and then a year like 2011, 2013, they iterate and they go through through a process to update them. So the, the tricky part is that phrase that you use there, latest and greatest, those aren't necessarily linked, right? How many mm. times have you seen code released that is the latest, but it ain't the greatest, and you have to have a, a break fix or a patch, right? So as the stakes rise on the consequences of getting it wrong, uh, you need to put process and governance and checks and balances in place to make sure that the latest is the greatest, right? And if you've got a small... Uh, small open source team with uh, with a benevolent dictator uh, for life and two or three contributors, you know what? People have brain farts. Things are going to happen. Life intervenes. The, the project gets abandoned. So you can't depend on GitHub structurally for that. It will be the latest, but it may be out of date. There may be other issues. So we still haven't figured that one out yet, in my view. Go ahead, Aaron. If you, that, 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 oh no, that's it. That. That's a good answer. Yeah, um, I, I was I was looking at the on, on the uh, the back channel chat. And somebody asked, "Is cloud a standard?" Um, and that's oh, I mean, that's kind of an interesting question because um, cloud suddenly happened, and it happened around really around Amazon realizing that. Um, I mean, it, I guess it sort of began in a way with IBM. We had them on a few weeks ago. Um, Saying, well, we could put a lot of Linux on a single mainframe, and then they're all and that's sort of like the original cloud. It wasn't called that. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember his name. I can't, but anyway, somebody wrote a um, uh, a, uh, a a book on utility computing um, called The Big Switch long before um, yeah. it got called the cloud. But the cloud is such a vague term. So yeah, you know, it's 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 marketing speak for someone else's server somewhere else. That's all it is, yeah. right? Yeah. So well, there's an interesting thing there. So, you know, a big I mean, part of where open source and before that free software came from, and the free software movement remains very steadfast about this, which is, and in fact, I think that's, it was Richard Stallman who first said the cloud is somebody else's computer, um, which is personal independence. You you need to be independent as an individual in order to operate in the, in the connected world. And we go through these phases of losing that. Um, you know, to the degree, like, I mean, I, in my own case, I used to operate my own web server. I used to operate my own, um, email server, which, do you um, keep your money, do you keep your money in your mattress? No, I don't. But that's the thing. I don't keep my money in my mattress. I don't even know where it is. <laughs> you know, my wife takes care of it. <laughs> so but that's, that's I'll, my I'll thing. Push ahead, back, I'll, see, yeah. I'll push back a little bit on that characterization. And this, uh, just, if you think of the, uh, the social graph or, the, or a graph network, right? You and I are nodes on the network uh, and the connections between us are the edges. What makes us people isn't 
the, the, the node by itself. That's a hermit living in the woods by himself, right? That's the Unabomber. What makes us people are the edges that connect to us. So, and privacy isn't about secrecy and isolation. Privacy is about choice in how I, what nodes or what nodes I connect to and what goes over those edges. So you can't really claim to be an individual unless you're an individual in the context of other individuals. And we all have so much going on in our lives that unless you're a total geek, like if you're a total finance geek, maybe all your money will be directly under your control uh, all the time. But most people uh, delegate someone to, to act for them, a bank or an investor, and they give them instructions or they find a investor that works along, uh, that supports their idea. You join an open source project because the goals and people in that project are aligned with your, with your values. So the individuality is, is a real thing, but it's what makes it really work and rewarding is in conjunction with other individuals. And that's what privacy is, how to define that for yourself. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah I think no, it, it does, does make I, sense. I, I'm kind of Go curious. Ahead. So, talk, yeah, talking about cloud, what about the Linux kernel? I mean, isn't that a standard these days? I mean, you, I wouldn't say that yeah. you, know, you got all these distributions, right, and everything, but at the base of it, they all go back to the same Linux kernel. Well, and sure, when Linus uh, or uh, was doing it himself, it was effectively a, a standard. But, but now that there's a Linux foundation, uh, and I it's rec and I think it's now a standards development organization because there's there's a there's a whole thing around. Are you a standards organization that other standards organization will recognize so that they can incorporate it into their standards? It's turtles all the way down in this world. Um, so now, even though, as I understand it, Linus is still the, 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 the lead on that. And there's a core group of contributors, like most software projects. It has this broader governance framework because it's a part of the Linux Foundation. So, so governance frameworks, okay, I, I don't know what the Google trends on this would be, but I have probably heard the term governance framework more often in the last two years than I ever heard before. If I'd never heard about it, maybe more than three or four years ago. Um, uh, and actually, I think it was in 2014, and it was from um, Drummond Reed when he was working with his company of the time. But you're involved with a lot of those and the whole notion of a governance framework, like the whole SSI thing, which you've talked about, um, uh, has governance framework mentioned often within it. And so I'm wondering, as, as we're getting kind of toward the end of the show right now, if you could explain to us what's a governance framework and how does that and to what degree is that formalized or just implied? I mean, the maintainers and committers and stuff like that, that's a governance framework, right? Within within a development community, an open source development community, whatever they're called, everybody understands what they are. There's a kind of, not so much a hierarchy no, as, well, that's, as a set of paths. But go ahead on framework, that. Yeah, I don't think it's the developers and the maintainers. Those are uh, the developers and the maintainers are like the people that do the work. The governance framework is the board that oversees it. So the, um, right. right, so if you think about a, a company, uh, uh, like I sit on, on some, some charity boards and some NGO boards, our job is to provide direction and oversight to make sure that the guardrails that the company operates under are appropriate. Um, so, or to borrow uh, from Lawrence Lessig's framework, uh, governance frameworks are how you capture norms in a, in a way that people can actually uh, agree on what those are for the organization and set out uh, ways to uh, stay within those norms. Do do government's frameworks live within standards bodies or are they completely independent things? Uh, there's a there's a yin and yang there. So there's there are there are ISO standards on governance and then there's the ISO is governed by governance. So it's it, it it's it's Ouroboros. It's a worm that eats itself. Uh, <laughs> right. 
So, so actually, that brings up what will be a quick last question for me that may not even be one you can answer. I don't know. I'm sure you have an answer for this, though. I'll um, make something up. There, there is in botany now an understanding that within a forest, all of the plants communicate through a kind of internet. They call it the World Wood Web, um, uh, <laughs> or the Wood, or the Wood Wide Web. But, but basically, they communicate through rhizomal fungus, and carbon is exchanged, messages are exchanged, understandings are exchanged. It's not only competitive in the Darwinian sense, but cooperative as well, and. And it strikes me that in a way the internet is maybe the first form of that or maybe some standards within it do that. But I'm not sure we have the rhizomes yet. I'm not sure we have those. And as the very great book, um, The Overstory by Richard Powers uh, mentions in it, um, and I recommend that, um, the we're 50 years away from really knowing how forests work. And I'm, I almost wonder whether we're building the forest we don't understand at the moment and uh, and and what you're working on is kind of bringing sense to it all, because that's what I see you doing. Uh, you're involved in more stuff than anybody else I know. So, yeah, I get bored. Um, <laughs> the, is there a standard for that? <laughs> yeah, I, I wish ADHD. Um, so the the. Uh, the the I can't I can't uh, talk about uh, the botany uh, the the botany thing, but uh, what it did pop into my head was one of the most startling things when I did my I did a mid career MBA um, was when my uh, professor of one of my finance courses who's a PhD in accounting I didn't know you could do a PhD in accounting and he said accounting is a social science. Now, my first degrees were in history, which are humanities, and so as, and I always thought of accounting as much more hard-edged, but then I realized, essentially, accounting is how we socially determine how we want to do those kinds of transactions, and we can change the rules if we want to. So, uh, yes, I think the answer to your question is we, we're building those communications methods, but just like um, memes are not genes, although they serve the same function as uh, as genes do in a genetic code. And I, Richard Dawkins has been, I think, overtaken by other things. The gene is recognized as no longer selfish, but all cooperative in the way that you just described. Um, we still haven't figured out how to manage memes uh, in the way that, uh, and what are the rules and governance of memes and social interactions over this thing that we're building? And that's so going to be an interesting we, project. Yeah, no kidding. Wow. Um, <laughs> it's, so we're 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 at the end of the show, and where we ask um, uh, some quick questions uh, to to close it out. The first is: Is there any question that you could answer quickly that we haven't asked and should have? Uh, should you get involved in standards? <laughs> no, I think that is a possible one. I suppose that's up to anybody uh, if they want well, to. If if you if you like uh, making change at an extreme distance and over an extreme amount of time with a lot of frustration and a lot of patience, then absolutely. <laughs> The, 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 there's a story I have around that that was told to me by somebody that our rules against profanity uh, prevent me from mentioning. So, um, <laughs> do you have anything? Do you have anything to say about blockchain? That's our control question, or one of them. Uh, there are use cases, but they're hiding in dark places far, far away, and it's uh, uh, it, very rare that there's a real use case for for a for a block a blockchain, especially one that has such a cost on the environment as Bitcoin. Let's see. That's good. So um, uh, the next are, um, and these are our final questions. What are your favorite text editor and scripting language? If you have some of those. Uh, Sublime text. And back when I was uh, uh, an operations guy, like I was, I was a Perl as a Perl guy. Uh, I'm doing stuff now. I don't do a lot of scripting, but it's more likely to be in Python. Actually, Aaron had a quick question in the back channel. You want to ask it quick, Aaron? 
<laughs> well, I was just thinking as you were giving your answer to, uh, you know, do you want to get involved in uh, developing standards? I mean, it sounds almost as bad as working in local government, you know, on a city council or something. Uh, I, I can't imagine. I, I don't understand how people want to do that. <laughs> it just sounds like so much but, pain. But it's uh, well, actually, local government is the most impactful on people's lives. And standards is the most impactful on the way we interact with each other to the point of you can now just go to Ikea and slam together or go to your local lumber store and slam together a shelf because of standards. So if you don't ever want to be thanked but have an enormous sense of satisfaction, get involved. Okay, that's a more positive message. I like that. That's good. The, the, this is a moment in a show, and this is uh, one of those when I feel like, geez, I wish we were doing this over beers at, at, at a bar and running out of fries, and we could talk about this for for another for well, another couple hours. I'm, and drift. I'm definitely in the next time IIW is in person. I'm definitely going to be there, so <laughs> we'll put okay. a placeholder on that. Yeah, uh, we've talked about IW a few times, but people know it's the Internet Identity Workshop, iiworkshop.org. If you want to take the short link there. John, plus, thank plus you so work, much for being on the show. And I work with show. a startup in the Bay Area, so yeah, yeah, from 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 t- Toronto, no less. Okay, well, yeah. thank you so much, everybody, um, uh, and and thank you, John, for being on the show. Um, so so, Aaron, how'd that how'd that go for you? Since you're new to most of it, I think, at least in terms of no. Oh, I mean, it's interesting. I think everyone has an interest level or a specialty in one area or another that's affected by standards. Like I said, it affects all of us. Um, you know, it, it, it's interesting to see, you know, I've worked for monitoring companies, monitoring, uh, uh, software companies for a while now. And the one that I'm currently working for Sysdig, a lot of what our companies, uh, our customers are interested in are security standards. So either CIS for internet for security parts. standards or, uh, PCI for payment standards yeah. and a lot of their time um, and what our software helps them do is validate that they're meeting these standards and being able to address issues when they come up, you know, because there are also standards about how you deal with e- when an issue arises. If my information is stolen, what do I mm-hmm. have to, you know, to do? And so I think for me, you know, just it, it's just amazing to hear about all of these uh, different areas of our lives, basically, where um, these standards come into play and how important they are and, and, and how important they are to uh, not only develop and codify, but then also to adhere to. So, yeah, yeah, really interesting stuff, something you don't think about a lot. But when you do start thinking about it, it's like, holy moly, what would I, I couldn't even get up out of my chair if there wasn't <laughs> a standard to, around, you know, how it how it works and how it's supposed to, uh, how much weight it's supposed to hold up, for example. And and here's, yeah, here's one I wouldn't put on the call. But if you think there's, there's standards that you don't, you, the, that are inherently unethical to some people, right? So if you're a vegan, the standards for ethical uh, slaughter of animals, you know, it seems completely bizarre to you. But for the for the rest of us that are discretionary vegetarians or, or meat eaters, it's of some value to know that there are standards to make sure that our beef is pesticide free or this and that and the other. So choosing which standards apply is also an interesting uh, process because there may be competing standards in the same area. You know, I, I'm reminded of when I um, your point about uh, the the electrical the electric socket and not well, not not wanting to get electrocuted reminded me that I, I used to 30 years ago if I went to Europe I carried like a five pound um, uh, converter 220 50 cycle to 110 uh, 60 cycle converter and because you needed one of those and of course the proper socket and all the rest of the the, the adapter. And now basically you just need the adapter because everything made is working at both 110 and, and uh, you know, 110, 60 and, and 220. Well, um, and, 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 and all the circuitry that used to be in that big adapter has shrunk it down, right? I, I still have a bag right. of adapters because Asia is different than Africa, it's different than Europe. And so I have right. a whole bag of adapters that I, and my travel go kit, but uh, yeah. Yeah. And it's, and it's, um, and and basically the the problem in the first place was that the, the original manufacturers didn't they wanted to trap their customers inside one of those standards, and you know well, sure. the, the U.S. 
was was there maybe North America was saying screw it to Europe or vice versa. I don't remember. I don't. I wasn't around. I'm not young, but well, I wasn't well, old enough to remember that. But it it, well, it went on. It was not just DC versus AC. It was this whole thing. Well, railroads are a great example. The early railroads each had unique gauges, and they were trying to do the same thing. They were trying to capture the market. If you want to, if you want to transport goods, you have to do it on my railroad because my railroad the tracks are this far apart, and that other guy's railroad. The, if you yeah. load it on my cars, it won't fit. And, they, and you ended up standard on a standardized uh, standardized gauge so that railroads could interoperate. And then the, yeah, so you get to, we are the same. Yeah, go ahead, sir. Yeah. Uh, or, or, or Bitcoin people haven't studied, uh, and this is not my area, so uh, if the chat is listening, I could be corrected. But it used to be in the 18th, 19th century, banks issued their own currency. Uh, yeah. And so you get banknotes from the Bank of Idaho or banknotes from the Bank of New York. And that led to incredible volatility and speculation and collapsing banks. And it turns out that having standardized currency backed by the, by the government, whether it's gold or fiat, uh, is a lot better than having individual currencies uh, backed by independent bodies, no matter how independent that might seem. It was not a good thing at the end of the day. Yeah. So I'm getting a message from our folks here because we're on a network that has to another show coming up and I have to record a bunch of stuff that we are out of time. So um, uh, we didn't get to really quick, Aaron, plug whatever you're doing and then we'll we'll call it a wrap. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would just that say uh, go out and buy Linux for makers uh, as a Christmas present this year. Uh, if you have someone that's <laughs> interested in Raspberry Pi. And then go watch my new uh, channel on YouTube. It's called Retro Hack Shack. And I've been doing a lot of stuff around video lately for some reason. The latest video I just restored an IBM 5154 EGA monitor, which was no, which was not working. I brought it back to life and got it looking brand new. Uh, so go subscribe to that channel if you like to see old technology uh, restorations and repairs and those kinds of things. All right. Excellent. Well, thanks so much. Um, and thank you, uh, John Wunderlich. Uh, and um, uh, next week, we will have the Linux Foundation on the show. So that's a that's a tease for then. In the meantime, this has been Floss Weekly. I'm Doc Searles, and we will see and hear you next week. Hi, I'm Jason Howell, host of All About Android, where each week I'm joined by my co-hosts Florence Ion and Ron Richards. And we talk about everything that has to do with Android. Is it news? Is it hardware? Is it apps? Well, you name it, we talk about it. We invite guests from the industry on the show. We even sometimes have people from the Android team themselves talking about what makes Android so great. And you can subscribe so you don't miss anything about the world of Android by going to twit.tv slash AAA. We'll see you there. <laughs>